Amen. You ever get homesick? Oh, Lord, sometimes I think, Lord, it, it couldn't be too soon. Today could not be too soon. Amen. If you have your Bibles tonight and you'd open them to the Old Testament book of Exodus, chapter 13. We're going to begin at verse 17 and read through verse 22. Exodus 17. I'm sorry, 13, beginning at verse 17 through verse 22, standing in honor of the reading of God's word, the word of the Lord reads, And it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near, for God said, Lest preadventure the people repent when they see war, and they return to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones away hence with you. And they took their journey from Succoth and encamped in Etham, in the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud and led them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Where are we going? We're starting a brand new year. This is a good time to ask the question, where are we going? Master, we thank you, God, for your word. It is exalted tonight above the heavens. We know, God, that the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Lord Jesus, as you've placed a word of exhortation, a message in my spirit for this time, we ask God today now that your anointing would rest upon us. God, that you'd help me to deliver it in such a way that it would bring forth glory and honor to the wonderful name of Jesus. Lord, let every individual that might ever hear this message by whatever medium they might hear it, let them today hear the word of the Lord and know, God, that they've heard from heaven and not merely these lips of clay, not merely this preacher in the Dallas, Texas area. Master, today speak to us, we pray. Use your servant, anoint our ears to hear that we might receive that which you would speak to us at this hour, for we ask it in Jesus' wonderful name, amen, praise God, and amen. You may be seated tonight. Where are we going? Isn't it interesting? As every time we come to a new year, without fail, we kind of tend to look at our lives a little bit and think, all right, what have we done what have we accomplished? What have we, where have we gotten to and where are we headed? And that is an important question. A lot of times, if you don't know where you're going, then you'd rather stand still than move. If you don't know where you're going, you'd rather just go ahead and stay where you're at than try to do anything because you're not certain where you're headed and what your direction is. It's interesting in our primary text tonight, that God had called Moses to a leadership position. Let me tell you all a little secret. Like I said when Brother Farrell was here the other day from 10, God does not call committees. He has never called a committee in all of eternity. God has never called a committee. He has called leaders. He has called individuals that you could point to, and they could stand accountable for the message that was delivered from heaven. God called Moses a single man, an individual, to stand before Pharaoh and to declare, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, let my people go. He didn't call any committees. He called leadership. If there's ever an example of leadership in Scripture, if there's ever an, an excellent study in leadership, uh, it's found in the book of Exodus as Moses is being used of God to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt and into the land that was promised to them by God himself. But you'll notice that right from the very beginning of our text tonight, the Bible tells us that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. 
Hmm. I'm going to tell you tonight, God doesn't always lead us in the easiest route. God doesn't always lead us in the closest route. God doesn't always take us the way that we would say, well, but wouldn't it be easier to get where we're going if we went this way instead of that way? Yes, in one regard it might be. But God also knows how difficult, even though it's a closer route, it would be a more difficult route because it would pass through the land of the Philistines. And in order to get through the land of the Philistines, who were a warring people, you were going to have to fight your way through. And the Lord said in, in chapter 13 of Exodus and verse 17 uh, that he knew that if the children of Israel had to face battle that early on in their exodus from Egypt, he said, no, 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 honey, they would all of a sudden decide it ain't worth it, it's not worth it, I'll just turn around and I will go back to Egypt. It's easier to be in Egypt than it is to fight in the land of the Philistines. You know, sometimes there are routes that might be easier, but they might be closer they might be a shorter path to our destination. The Lord, only the Lord knows what kind of battles we would have to fight as we traveled that path. Do you hear what I'm saying? And God is sparing us the heartache. He's sparing us the trouble. He's sparing us the discouragement. You know, God doesn't want his people to be discouraged. Do you know that? God does not want his people to become discouraged and backslide and lose out with him. It is not his desire that they become discouraged. God is not a discourager, but an encourager. So therefore, sometimes he may have us walk a longer path to get to the same destination. But my friend, he does so, so that we don't have to fight as many battles, and we don't have to deal with the spirit of discouragement, and we don't have to wrestle with the notion of going back to that place where we were before we found God, before we found the Lord, before we found faith, before we knew what it was to live and walk by faith. But the Bible said that God led the people of Israel uh, but God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. My Lord, have mercy. Sometimes God, not only will he not take you in the quickest route and the shortest route, Lord knows after four years of being in this community, we can say, Lord, you sure haven't taken us on the shortest route. Amen. You sure haven't taken us on the quickest route. We sure haven't gotten to our destination quickly. But not only does he not take us on the shortest and the quickest route, but, honey, the opposite route that God takes us on oftentimes will have insurmountable, uh, insurmountable uh, ob uh, objects that are in our path, and they are there not to hold us back, but to give us a better revelation of who God is and what God can do. The Red Sea was in their way. Between them and freedom was the Red Sea. But God was saying, don't be dismayed, don't fear, don't worry. That uh, body of water is there tonight not to discourage you, but to give me an opportunity to show you how great and how powerful I am. Hallelujah. Glory to God. See, we get, we get up to a, oh, hallelujah, I'm preaching to myself tonight. We get up to an obstacle sometimes, and we get so discouraged, and we say, Lord, but this river's in our way, but this sea is in our way. And God says, don't worry, because this sea is going to serve two purposes. Number one, it is going to be a revelation to you of my power. It is going to be a revelation to you of my glory. But I'll tell you what else it's going to do. It's going to drown your past. Hallelujah. It's going to destroy your enemies. Glory to God. Once you pass through this river, there will be no Egyptians behind you. Glory to God. Woo, hallelujah. So see, whatever path God leads us on, we need to learn to trust Him. Where are we going? We know where we're going. We're headed for Canaan. We're headed for Beulah land. We know where we're going. But why must we question God along the way? 
Why must we question the Lord uh, as we journey toward our destination? We know that one morning our journey is going to end in the sound of the trumpet and the resurrection of the saints. We know this is going to happen. So why must we question God daily? Lord, where are we going? <sighs> call ourselves believers and yet we constantly ask the Lord where are we going if you don't know where you're going then I I wonder if you've really got much with God I know where I'm going don't you I want you to know tonight becoming a child of God and being a child of God are two very different things it's interesting how many times people use scriptures and they try to apply them to uh, becoming a child of God. They'll say, this verse uh, has to do with becoming a child of God, being converted. No, it doesn't. That verse has to do with being a child of God, how you continue to walk as a child of God. It don't have nothing to do with becoming a child of God. You want to know how to become a child of God? You've got to obey Peter's message on the day of Pentecost, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's the way to become a child of God. But if you are going to be a child of God, if you're going to continue as a child of God, that's a different ball of wax altogether. When Martin Luther read the words, the just shall live by faith, he mistakenly applied that to becoming a child of God and said, to become a child of God, all you need is faith. No, wrong, Mr. Luther. That verse was not about becoming a child of God. That verse was for those who had already become a child of God and who were trying now to live as and to be children of God. The Word of God declares in Romans 8, verses 10 through 16, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Listen, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, honey, that implies something. That implies two things. It implies, number one, that God is leading. It implies, number two, that we are following. Hello now. There are a lot of people out there today who want to call themselves believers, want to call themselves Christians, want to call themselves children of God, and yet they do not know how to follow the leading of the Holy Ghost when God speaks to them and says, here's what I want you to do. Here's where I want you to go. This is the direction I want you to take. They go another way. Well, I have news for you, my friend. According to Paul's definition of a child of God or a son of God, they are no longer a son of God. For when you part company with the leadership of the Spirit, you are no longer in the family of the Almighty. My Lord, have mercy. You see, God was leading his people out of Israel. He was using Moses to accomplish this task. But I want you to know tonight that if at any time, if at any point, they had chosen to stop following Moses, and if at any moment, in any time, Moses had decided to stop following the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. See, I love how good God is. Amen. God never wants you in the dark. He wants you to be able to see what's under your feet at all times. Glory to God. You're passing through a wilderness. There are going to be snakes. There are going to be scorpions. There are going to be spiders. There are going to be all kinds of nasty things that are going to crawl around that you could step on and hurt yourself. And the Lord said, I will not have a people who are walking in the dark. Hallelujah. But I will put a pillar of fire above them by night so that they can see every step of their journey. They can see where they're going and what they're doing and what they're about to step upon. But listen to this now. 
for all them preachers like to preach people into hell every Sunday, you know, and, and have such a negative message and don't know how to preach a good gospel message if it killed them. God also doesn't want his people scorched by the heat of the sun because in the daytime, God put a pillar of cloud above their head, hallelujah, so that he could filter out the sun's rays. And even though they were marching in a very, very hot environment in the wilderness, mother, they were a good 15 or 20 degrees less than they could have been if they weren't under the cover of a cloud. Hallelujah. So preacher, God don't want God's people coming into church so they can be preached into a hot, sunburned, blistering uh, situation. No, he put a pillar of cloud above them to protect them from the elements and to protect them from the, the heat rays of the sun and the light rays and the damaging rays of the sun. Lord have mercy. Running around for 40 years in the wilderness under the relentless... UV rays of the sun, and they didn't have sunscreen like we do today. My God, they'd all been dropping dead with skin cancer before they ever got to the promised land. But God knows how to provide, <laughs> and God knows how to protect. Amen. He knows how to point us in the right direction and help us to know which way we ought to go, and he knows how to protect us while we're walking in that way. But it is only those who are led by the Spirit of God today who have the right to identify as the sons of God. Paul goes on to say in Romans 8, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. When the Lord called me to Texas as a 16-year-old kid, I was nervous about it. I was uh, uncertain about it at some level. But in the final analysis, I knew God wasn't going to bring me somewhere where he couldn't keep me. I knew the Lord wasn't going to call me somewhere and let me down once I got there. And friend, I want to tell you one miracle after another miracle after another miracle. And even when I got tired of being here as a teenager and decided to go back home, the reality is God still had miracles unfolding before me. He still was providing to keep me on the way that he had called me to. And if God's called you tonight to be in a certain place, if God's called you to be part of a church, or if he's called you to be part of a ministry, if God's called you to be doing something in the kingdom of Almighty God, then honey, you better get where he's called you to be, because anywhere else is a sin. My Lord, have mercy. Being a child of God and becoming a child of God are two different things. There are a lot of people who make the start, and they become a child of God through the scriptural ad, ad, admin, admonishment to repent and be baptized and receive the Holy Ghost. But then that's where their journey ends. Because when the Spirit of God tries to lead them, oh, but the Holy Ghost spoke to my heart and said, go to Texas. I want you in Dallas, Texas. So where are you today? Oh, you're out in California, you're out in Michigan, you're out in Kentucky, you're out in uh, Pennsylvania, you're out in Florida, you're everywhere but you're supposed to be. Everywhere but you're supposed to be. Listen to what the Word of the Lord has to say. You want to talk about being a child of God? Matthew 21, 28 through 32. But what think ye, Jesus said, a certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented, and he went. He came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Now, whether of them twain did the will of his father? They say unto him, the first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward, that ye might believe him. I want you to know today, 
It's funny that according to Jesus, there are going to be harlots in heaven. There are going to be publicans up in glory. According to the Lord Jesus, there are going to be some people that we're told aren't going to be able to be there. But you know what? It's not about who they are. It's about what they were willing to believe. It's about what they were willing to lay hold of. It's about what they were willing to embrace and grab hold of. And the Lord said, there were two sons. One the father asked to go. He said, I won't, but he did. The other he asked to go. He said, I will, but he didn't. Children, I want you to know tonight, this prize is not going to go to the one who says, yes, I'll go, but doesn't. It is going to go to the one who says, I'll go and does. Because anything short of that is disobedience and unbelief. The children of Israel in their journey out of the wilderness were filled with unbelief and lack of faith. They were constantly troubled by circumstance and allowed circumstance. How many people contact me? Oh, the Lord told me to come be a part of your church. But I've got to get my bills paid. I've got to... Uh, get caught up on this. I've got to get caught up on that. Oh, I've got to do this. I've got to... Honey, you don't have to do anything. If God told you to come, the only thing you've got to do is come. That's the only thing you've got to do. All that other stuff, if God didn't have that under control, then he wouldn't have talked to you from the get-go. If the Lord tells you to do something, you better get up and do because if you're not following after the leading of God's Spirit, then children, you are not a child of God. You can call yourself what you want to call yourself. You're not a child of God. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The only true people who can identify as the sons and daughters of God tonight are those who are following after the leading of God's Spirit. Sometimes we're not sure of the route we take. But we know for certainty what our destination is. I do not always understand why the Lord takes me through certain valleys or why he might take us over certain mountaintops. But you can rest assured that in the end, we will arrive in Canaan. Hallelujah. Where are we headed? We know where we're headed. Hallelujah. We may not understand the path that we're traveling till we get there because God is in control. But if I'm going to identify as a child of God, I can only do so if I will follow as he leads. My Lord, have mercy. Jesus promised in John 14, 1 through 5, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. I know where I'm going. I know my destination. Amen. Where are we going? I know where we're going. I know the destination. The Lord's promised it. He's told me. He said, and whither I go, ye know, and ye know, and the way ye know. He said to his disciples, he says, y'all know the destination, and you know how to get there. And Thomas said unto him, you remember old Doubting Thomas? You always got one of them knuckleheads that... You know, the Lord talking to them, and they just don't get it. They just don't understand what he's saying. I just, Lord, I'm sorry, but I'm about five steps behind you here. I just don't get it. And Thomas says to him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Well, Lord, I don't know what you're talking about. I haven't got a clue what you're talking about. I don't know where you're going. I don't know how to get there. What are you talking about? Thomas if you'd been following the leading of the Spirit, then you would have been right in step with the Lord as he spoke, and you would have understood stood exactly what he was saying. And you would have understood that he just said to you, I am going to prepare a place for you, and I'm going to come back and get you. So, honey, if you're going to get there, how are you going to get there? The very next verse tells us, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. I, I, myself, that where ye, uh, I am, ye may be also. I, therefore, honey, if you're going to get there where he's talking about, it sounds to me like you need to hook up with him. 
Because he said he's going to make the place. He said he's going to get us. He's going to get us and take us to where he is. And while that he, he wants us to be with him where he is at. So if you want to get to that destination, it doesn't sound real hard to me. I doubt highly that Muhammad is going to get you there. I doubt highly that Buddha is going to get you there. I think you need to hook up with Jesus. He's the one who made the promise. He's the one who said he was making a place. He's the one who said he was coming again. He's the one who said he'd take us out of this mess. And he's the one who said he was going to keep us with him where he is. Glory to God. Mother, I'll tell you what, I don't know a lot of times. I don't know this journey, you know, sometimes you wonder, where in the world am I going? <laughs> I know my final destination, but Lord, what's my next destination? You ever take a journey, you ever take a, tri a trip, and you're traveling, and you know you're going from Connecticut to Texas, but I got news for you, you're going to hit a lot of places before you get to Texas. <laughs> You're going to hit Memphis, and you're going to hit Philly, and you're going to hit Washington, D.C., and you're going to hit uh, all these different destinations along the way. Because there are destinations along the way till you get to your final destination. That's why we have what we call short-term goals and long-term goals. You've got your long-term goals, but you can't get to your long-term unless you first set and establish and work toward your short-term. Amen. If I get in my car tonight and want to drive home to Connecticut, it's all well and good to have my goal to be to pull into my grandmother's uh, gr uh, driveway at 37 Quarry Road, Beacon Falls, Connecticut. It's all well and good to have that goal. But you know what? It doesn't hurt along the way to set your sights on Texarkana. It doesn't hurt along the way to set your sights on Little Rock. Or it doesn't hurt along the way to set your sights on West Virginia. Or it doesn't hurt along the way to set your sights on Chattanooga or whatever city or town you're going to pass through. Because then, as you reach each uh, minor uh, goal, as you reach each of your short-term goals, goals, you know that you're that much closer to your long-term goal. Lord, have mercy. And sometimes when I say, Lord, where am I headed? Where am I going? Where are we going? I'm not asking him the long-term. I know the long-term, but I want to know what, what's the next city I'm going to stop in is. I want to know if the next city I stop in is going to have a church with 500 members or not in it where we're shouting the victory and people are getting the Holy Ghost and people are being healed and people are being delivered and folks are jumping up out of wheelchairs and people are throwing canes and giving concussions to others who are otherwise in good condition. That's what I want to know. I want to know the short term. I want to know my next destination, not my final destination. My final destination is set in stone. Hallelujah. But I want to know my long-term, my short-term destination, my next stopping point. Amen. But, Mother, I'll tell you, I've made up my mind a long time ago. This much I know. Even when I am uncertain of where I am, and even when I am uncertain as to where I am going, I'm not going back to Egypt. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I made up my mind. It doesn't matter to me, Lord, you're leading, and I'm following. And it doesn't matter to me, regardless if I haven't got a clue what my next destination is. If I haven't got a clue what my next city or my next port or my next stop or my, my next resting place might be. This much I made up my mind. I am not going to turn around. I am not going back to Egypt. Hallelujah. I'm glad to be out of there. I'm glad to be out of a place of this. I'm glad to be out of a place of unbelief. I'm glad to be out of the place of fear. I'm glad to be out of the place where I serve sin. But rather today, I walk in the liberty of the Holy Ghost. And I walk in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and God. I will not go back to Egypt. Hallelujah. Woo, Exodus 14, verses 10 through 14. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. And, be and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? 
Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us, to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? You know, some people just as happy to be stuck in a barroom lifestyle. Some people just as happy to be stuck living the life of an alcoholic. Some people are just as happy tonight to be stuck in every weekend at the dance club. Some people are happy to be stuck in the land of Egypt. They're happy to be serving sin. They don't want a life that involves God. They don't want a life that involves faith. They don't want a life that acknowledges Jesus Christ as Lord. No, they're like, no, why? I don't want to go out there. Why, good God, I'm going to face up. Obstacles. I'm going to face difficulties. Honey, life will deliver you obstacles. Life will deliver you difficulties. Whether you're serving God or not serving God, one way or the other, you're bound to see a few. The difference is, do you want to see them as a real estate holder or the servant of the real estate holder? You hear me now? Amen. You want to be serving the Egyptians? And they're the ones that own the homes, and they're the ones that own the cattle, and they're the ones that own the jewels, and they're the ones that own the land. Or do you want to be the one that owns the house and owns the cattle and owns the land? Hallelujah. I'd rather be free. Glory to God. I'd rather serve God. I'd rather walk with Him. I'd rather follow Him. Because I know in the end when I get to my destination, I'm going to be free. Hallelujah. Like the old song says, free at last. And Moses said unto the people, listen, fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he shall show you to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. See, I told you that river was to serve a purpose it was for the people of Israel, it was a revelation of God's power and his glory. But for the Egyptians, it was God's way of washing them off of the Egyptians. You see, the passing by God's people through the river, uh, excuse me, through the Red Sea, was a type of water baptism. The Bible said that the people of Israel were baptized unto Moses in the Red Sea. And we're baptized into Christ in water baptism. You see, not only do we pass through the water and come out the other side, but all our enemies are left in the water. All our enemies are left there to die. All our enemies are left there to drown. God didn't just use that as a means of showing us his power and his glory, but he used it so that it could serve as a type of water baptism and the washing away of our sin and the washing away of our past. And those, that, those things that held us captive are washed away in the water, and no longer are we captive to anyone, but now we're free. And like Moses said, from this day forward, you'll never see the Egyptians again. Because once God has washed them down the Red Sea, <laughs> he says, honey, never again will you ever have to face them. When God has washed our sins away, never again will we ever have to face them. You will not get in the judgment and stand before God and the Lord say, now what about this? What about that? What about this? No, sir, because they went down the Red Sea. They went down in the waters of baptism. They're gone. They're finished. They're over. They're done with. All you've got to answer to God for now is everything that happened since the Red Sea. Amen. There's a lot of people come through the Red Sea, like I said, and then all of a sudden they think they can just start doing things their way. They can start walking in whatever direction they choose to walk in. They don't have to follow the leading of the Holy Ghost. I want to tell you tonight... The Lord called me to Texas when I was 16 years old, and he specifically said to me, I am going to train you for your ministry. You can't preach faith if you haven't lived faith. If you don't know what faith is in the most practical sense, then you cannot possibly preach it and help others to find it. And I'm going to tell you, there, there are too many people out there in our Christian world, especially in our communities tonight, who don't seem to understand this principle. 
Moses spent a third of his life living in the lap of luxury. He was 40 when he saw an Egyptian abusing an Israeli slave, a Jewish slave. And he stood up for that slave, and in the process of doing so, he, he killed the Egyptian. And at that point, he became a fugitive, and he ran. And he ran out into the wilderness, the same wilderness that he would later lead the children of Israel through. You see, sometimes God has got to take you there by yourself before he can use you to lead anybody else through there. Amen. Been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. Amen. Sometimes God has got to put you there. And isn't it funny that Moses was out there in that wilderness for what period of time? For another third of his life. Forty years. And it was during that time that God was preparing Moses. What was Moses doing during that time? Well, he was working with Jethro and his, his father-in-law. Got himself a wife. What was Moses doing during that time? He was tending sheep. See, a pastor is a shepherd. He has to tend the sheep. Moses was going to be leading God's people, and God's people are going to be just like sheep. Bah, making racket the whole time. Complaining and groaning. Not knowing where they're going. But he was going to have to learn how to lead. He was going to learn how to shepherd. And it took 40 years for Moses to learn all that he needed to learn till God could speak to him from the burning fiery bush and say, now I have a job for you. Yeah. So 80 years old, he's finally being sent into Israel at the age of, uh, into Egypt at the age of 80. And then Moses had one third of his life remaining. And it was the last third of his life in which he executed that for which he had been prepared. But he had, the Lord had prepared him for as long as he used him. He prepared him 40 years, and then he used him as a leader for 40 years. There are people out here in our world today, in our church today, they just think God's going to use them, and they just think they're going to run out there and do stuff overnight and bless God. They don't need to spend any time preparing. They don't need to get ready. They don't need, honey, oh, yes, you do. The work of God suffers when people who are ill-prepared run out and try to do something that they are not prepared to do. There are people that God has spoken to to come and be a part of this ministry, and the Lord spoke to me that he was going to send them before they ever called me and said the Lord told me. I knew before they knew. But I also know why God was sending them this way. He may have great things in plan for them. He may have great things in store for them. He may one day, Tommy, have a great ministry for some of these preachers that he's spoken to to come this way. But you know what? Until they spend their 40 years in the wilderness preparing, they are not going to be in a position to spend 40 years executing what they have been prepared for. And God has spoken to me on many occasions with different ones that he's spoken to to come here. And the Lord has said, see, now I'm sending them here to prepare them. You remember when I sent you to Brother Gillum's church to prepare you? You remember the lessons you learned under Brother Gillum? You remember how that man became such an important, integral part of your life and ministry and how you learned such great lessons from him and watching his ministry and you learned so much from him? Yes, Lord, I sure do. He says, well, now you're in a position to be the Brother Gillum and I'm calling people to come like I called you to come to Texas back in 1982. Now I'm calling these others to come so that I can prepare them the same way that I prepared you, so that they can learn faith the same way that you learned faith, because you sat under a man of God who knew what faith was, who knew what the power of God was. I'm going to tell you, if you have never been in a church where uh, 
the Spirit of the Lord is able to move freely, and, and, and the power of God is able to flow like a river. It's a wonderful thing. I grew up in Pentecost, but when I came to Texas and came into Brother Gillum's church, all of a sudden I learned what it was to just let go and let God not be so hung up on you and your ministry and you're the pastor, but just let God do whatever God wants to do. And if he wants to sweep through and start healing people and delivering people and filling people with the Holy Ghost, well, then that's well and good. There's no need to preach tonight. Just let him do what he wants to do. See, I learned that from Brother Gillum. But I'm going to tell you, even when I learned that from Brother Gillum, there were precious few Pentecostal preachers that really still understood those principles. Brother Gillum was one of very few. The Riverside Church was one of very, very, very few that was still shouting in the aisles and having church and letting the Spirit of the Lord move. It was one of very few. And you know what? There are knuckleheads, morons all over this country tonight that God has spoken to to come and be part of this church. And if they would get off their duff and follow the leading of the Lord and do what God called them to do, we would have another Riverside Church right here. We'll be shouting in the aisles. We'll be seeing the power of God move. We'll be seeing the glory of the Lord fall. We'll be seeing people healed. We'll be seeing people delivered. We'll be seeing people receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. Friends, that's what God wants to do. I know where we're going because I know where God wants to send us. I know what God wants to do. The problem is, or the question is tonight, are you a child of God? Are you a son of God? Are you following the leading of his spirit? Because if not, then you cannot effectively, truthfully answer that question in the affirmative. Amen. Tonight, if anyone here in this tape or here in this message, I don't care who you are, what your name is, what your age, where you come from. If the Spirit of the Lord has spoken to you at any time in your life and told you a direction he wanted you to go in and you have not followed that direction, my friend, I'm telling you tonight, you're backslid. You may think that you're saved. You may think that, oh, but God will just work with me. There's such a thing as the perfect will of God and the permissive will of God. Lies. No such thing as the permissive will of God. It's either God's way or the highway. You're either in God's path or you're not uh, following God at all. So you don't follow the Lord when it's convenient and then not follow.